Hello there. My name is Minister Barton Aaron Porter, and today we're going to continue our study of the great book of Acts with the sixth chapter. Now, I'm going to be using the good old King James Version of the Bible, as I always do. So I encourage you to get your Bibles out and to study along with me. Acts chapter 6. Let's open with a word of prayer first. Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ, we ask that you forgive us for our sins, Lord. Wash us in the blood of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, who took away the sin of the world. Fill us with your precious Holy Spirit, Father, as we go into your word. Open up our eyes wide and unstop our ears, Lord, that we might hear and see the truth that you want us to learn this day. In Jesus Christ's precious name we pray, amen. Okay, Acts chapter 6, verse 1, reads, And in those days, when the number of the disciples were multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews, because their widows were neglected in the daily menstruation, okay? Now, the Grecians were Greek-speaking Jews, because when we look up the word Grecians in the Strong's Concordance, it's 1675, and it tells us it's a Hellenist or Greek-speaking Jew. So that's what the Grecians were. And then the Hebrews... When we look up the word Hebrews, is 1445. It says a Hebraean, that is Hebrew or Jew. And so there was a dispute going on in the church because the Greek-speaking Jews' widows weren't getting their fair share of provisions that the church was giving to widows. You know, So we're going to digress for a minute to support that the church was set up to meet the needs of those who had a need, and that's the way it should be today, but unfortunately, in a lot of churches today, it's not that way. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, uh, starting at verse 9, Paul writes there, Let not a widow be taken into the number under three score years. A score is 20, so three scores is 60. So don't let a widow be taken into the number under 60 years old, uh, having been the wife of one man. Now, these are the qualifications for that widow to get help from the church. She has to be 60 years old, and she has to have only had, had one husband. Verse 10, it says she has to be well reported, r reported of for good works if she had brought up children, if she have lodged strangers, that means, you know, uh, other Christians that came through where she lived and she took care of them, you know, gave them a place to stay and eat while they were there doing God's work. If she had washed the saints' feet, okay? It was the custom to wash the feet of people over there in that area. It still is to this day because they travel on a lot of sand and they have sandals on and the sand gets all in their feet so you wash their feet when they come to your house or give them water to, so they can wash it yourself or if you have a servant you have a servant do it anyway if she had relieved the afflicted if she had diligently followed every good work now I'm gonna skip a couple of verses for the sake of time uh, for verse 11 down to 15 he was saying don't let the young widows in there because they weren't going to stay faithful to Christ. After a while, they were going to get idle and start roaming around and gossiping house to house. And so he says, it's better for the younger widows to get remarried. A widow is a, a woman who has lost her husband. Anyway, when we jump down to verse 16, Paul says, If any man or woman that believeth have widows, let them relieve them, and let not the church be charged that it may relieve them that are widows indeed. In other words, if a woman lost her husband and became a widow, but she had children, 
Then Paul says, let her children take care of her. That way, those provisions could go to a true widow, a widow who has no children. So, this was what was going on in the church. You know, the Greek-speaking widows weren't getting their fair share. Anyway, let's go back to Acts and read verse 1 again. And in those days, when the number of the disciples were multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Okay? Verse 2. Then the twelve, that's the twelve apostles, called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. So they called all of the believers together and said, Hey, we know we have a situation here, but we can't stop doing what God called us to do to deal with this matter. You know, we can't serve tables. That's not what God called us to do. And this when deacons were established in the church in the sixth chapter. Anyway, verse 3, they said, Wherefore, or for this reason or for this purpose, brethren, or brothers, look ye out among ye seven men, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. So they say, get seven men that you know are honest men and godly men, full of the Holy Ghost and full of wisdom, and we, we'll give them authority to do this, to take care of this problem. Verse 4, but we will give ourselves continuously to prayer and to the ministry of the word. So here is biblical proof that everybody in the body of Christ is not called to do the same thing, okay? They said, we can't wait no tables. Our ministry is to be praying and studying God's word so we can teach the church, all right? All right, verse 5, and the saying pleased the whole multitude. They chose Stephen, uh, a man full of faith, and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicandor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. So these were the seven deacons, the first deacons mentioned in the Bible. Okay? So the church chose them. Verse 6. It says, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, you see, they prayed to God to make sure, they laid their hands on them. Verse 7, that was verse 6. And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. So even the priests, the Levites, some of them were converted and became followers of Jesus Christ. Um, verse 8. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Verse 9. Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines and, the Cy and Cyrenians and Alexandrians, and of them of Cilicia, and of Asia, disputing with Stephen. Okay? And, uh, verse 10, and they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. So, God used Stephen in a mighty way. Okay? Stephen was endued with power from above to do great signs and wonders. And I want you to not miss that when you are a servant of God, you're going to be met with persecution if you're being obedient and if you're doing what you're supposed to do. Now, if nobody's bothering you, everything is okay in your life, you better check your walk, okay? Because you're no threat to the devil, so that's why he doesn't bother you. Nine times out of ten, he already has you. You just don't know it. So any real Christian is going to suffer persecution. And we're going to really get into that 
in the next Bible study in the seventh chapter when Stephen becomes the first one to die for Jesus. So they couldn't resist the wisdom and the spirit which God gave him. And he's going to give them a real Bible lesson in the next, next, um, uh, the next Bible study, the seventh chapter. All right, verse eleven says, "Then they suborn men, which said, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God." So, what do they mean by they suborned men? That word suborn, when you look it up in the Strong's, is 5260. It means to throw in stealth, stealthily, that is introduced by collusion. In other words, they got some people to lie on him. Okay? Remember, Satan is the father of lies. This is, this is one of his main tools. And I did a video one time where I talked about lying and how dangerous lying is if you can get someone to believe your lies you can move them to do terrible things as we're going to see in the next bible study um so that's how the devil works if he if you're an honest upright person walking in the footsteps of jesus as best as you can he doesn't really have anything to use against you so he'll get people to outright lie on you and that's what he did he got some people to lie on Stephen. Verse 12, it says, And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes, which were, were those who hand copied the law, and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council. So they got people to believe it, and they grabbed them, and they brought him in front of the Sanhedrin. Okay? 13, And set up false witnesses, which said, this man ceased not to speak blasphemous words against this place and the law. 14. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. Now, he was talking about Jesus Christ, but they didn't have Christ's spirit. So they could not understand what he was saying. He wasn't speaking blasphemy or blasphemous words. He was just preaching the truth. But because they had not God's spirit, they, the devil was able to get them to think he was doing something wrong. 15. And all that sat in the council, looking steadfastly on him, saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. What that means is, they saw his face as though he was a messenger sent down from God. And he was a messenger from God. And we're going to get into the message that he's going to give them in the next Bible study, okay? But I don't want you to miss that when you are truly a servant of God doing his work, you're going to be persecuted, okay? In Matthew chapter 10, verse 16 through 18, Christ Jesus said, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. You see that? 17. But beware, but beware of what? Men, for they will deliver you up to the councils. And will scourge you in their synagogue. The word scourge means to whip you with a whip. They will beat you in their synagogues. That was the place where the Jews met for worship. So they're going to beat you right in their so-called churches. 18. And ye shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake. For a testimony. That means to bear witness of the truth of God Almighty. And his son Christ Jesus for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. And as we continue to go through this great book of Acts, we're going to see exactly what Jesus said was fulfilled, and it's being fulfilled even to this day all over the world. There are some countries where Christians are being put to death for their faith. Now, we haven't experienced that in this country yet. 
or at least not on a, on, a, on a big scale, but over in China and some of those Middle Eastern countries and, 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 and Russia, those atheist countries, man, they are butchering and killing our brothers and sisters in Christ every single day. So we should really take advantage of the religious liberties we have in this country. We should be doing everything we can to get the gospel out while we can because there will come a day when just like those people over there and these people we're reading about in the Bible suffered and became martyrs for Christ, many of us are going to have to do the same thing. That's right. Don't believe these false teachers telling you that you're going to be raptured away before all the trouble starts because the Bible does not teach that. Okay? Christ taught that the disciple is not above the master. He said, if they did it to me, they're going to do it to you. All right? So, if this particular Bible study has been a blessing to you, I encourage you to go to paypal.me slash Barton Porter and please make a financial contribution of any amount that you can afford. Whatever you give will be a tremendous blessing to me and this ministry. And last but not least, I want to tell you about my online t-shirt store at teespring.com slash stores slash Godware, where you will find shirts that I've designed like the one I'm wearing here. This is my a blood donor saved my life shirt, you know, John 316. And if you see something there, I encourage you to get some of my Godware. I have hoodies, I have coffee mugs, and I have even some uh, female t-shirts, you know. So go in the store and check it out. If you see something that you like, buy a shirt, because when you buy a shirt, you're also supporting this ministry, as well as my favorite charity, Feed My Starving Children, okay? Let's close with a word of prayer. Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, we thank you for your word, Father. We thank you for your mercy, which is new from every day. We thank you for Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God who was slain before the foundation of the world, who shed his precious blood for us at Calvary, the blood that will never lose its power, Lord, the blood that cleanses us from sin over and over again. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for coming into this world that you had to share in creating with the Father and dying for us. We put all our faith and hope in you. So, Father, we thank you. Jesus, we thank you. Holy Spirit, we thank you. Amen. So, until next time, this is Minister Barton Aaron Porter saying, may the good Lord continue to bless you and keep you all the days of your life. And be sure not to miss the next Bible study. When we go into the seventh chapter of this great book of Acts, God bless you and goodbye.